Our last speaker today is an alum alumnus of DSPT, Sean Bryan. Don't, I don't know where he is. Oh, okay, good. Um, Sean Bryan graduated DSPT in 2015 with an MA in theology with a Salesian Studies concentration. His master's thesis analyzed the ecclesiology inherent to documents of the Second Vatican Council and proposes the scriptural notion of liturgy as an interpretive lens that elucidates the relationship between formal ritual worship and its integrated expression in everyday life. His exploration led to practical applications geared toward the animation of the faithful and the church's mission, including the Lay Mission Project, which he founded with Father Michael Sweeney. Sean is also known as the Papal Ninja. From his participation in the NBC show, reality TV show, American Ninja Warrior, where he can be seen running obstacle courses in pursuit of absolute and total victory. He has been asked as an alumnus of DSPT to share the fruits of his contemplation on Gaudium et Spes in light of both the Lay Mission Project as well as his engagement with the world as the Papal Ninja. Please welcome Sean. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I've done a lot of talks and it doesn't get any easier, so I would ask for a quick prayer from you guys right now that the Holy Spirit may speak in and through me, that I may be calm and be able to present what the Spirit wants to speak through me to you guys. Okay, I have the courage now to do a skit for you guys. <laughs> um, certain people who shall rename, remain nameless didn't want to do a skit, so I'm gonna have to play both parts, okay? All right, here we go. Hey, Sean, uh, can you come up to the, to the convocation and uh, um, read this document, 37,000 words, and contemplate it? Um, okay, I, I can do that. And then share the fruits of your contemplation. You have 10 minutes. Go. That brings me to here. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about. I really do want to get into a lot, possibly even way too much. So what I'm going to do is um, shift what I had planned on doing and give you what Father Michael encouraged me to give you, what is most on my heart, what is the most important thing that I would like to communicate. So here we go. In the beginning of my contemplation on this document, I felt like St. Teresa of Avila, who reports that when she was praying, or when she prayed to Our Father, she got stuck at Our Father. <laughs> In this 37,000 word document, I kind of got stuck at Gaudium et Spes. <laughs> So the joys and the hopes, as we, as we heard time and time again throughout this, the, these presentations, the joys and hopes and the anxieties that, that are of men and women of this age are the same joys and hopes and anxieties and, and griefs of Christians. And that could be received in two different ways, uh, actually mainly two different ways. One is that um, we are in the world and we have the same anxieties of the world. And another way to, to interpret that perhaps from my Salesian formation, is more entering into the world in an incarnational sort of spirituality, understanding the joys and hopes of them, and they are the same as yours because you are um, presenting yourself to their life and being a life for them. And, of course, the world is full of slippery slopes and is very easy to be enticed by the world and very easy to, to fall into the same traps um, as Christians, as the world does. And I think that's where a lot of the anxiety of receiving this document, Gaudium et Spes, comes from. It comes from our cultural formation to receive it in a worldly way. So from the very beginning, the first thing that popped to my mind after getting, finally getting through that first paragraph was John 17. And this is going to be the heart of what I'm presenting to you, so I'm going to read it to you right now. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. Consecrate them in truth. Your word is truth. 
As you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. Put that aside for now. So instead of getting into a lot of the nitty gritty details about this paragraph says this, and this is the nuanced way that I would say it instead because I'm, I'm more perfect than the, the council as a whole, <laughs> or perhaps I interpret it differently now, I'm gonna give a manner of approach to the world rather than the nitty gritty uh, nuances of the document. The manner of the approach is this, discipleship. We don't have a category of thinking of discipleship as we once did. We don't really have anything parallel. So what happens is our imagination is filled. The gaps are filled by secular understandings or even by ambiguous church teachings that don't really take root in our life because we don't quite get what that means. So what it means is that we sit at the feet of our Lord and learn from him not only what he said, he didn't teach us an ideology, but he taught us a manner of approach to life. So how is it that we sit at his feet and learn from him the way in which he saw the world, engaged the world, conquered the world? So these are the things that we need to focus on as we receive this document, Gaudium et Spes. So there's a certain imagination problem that I've come up against with both the Lay Mission Project and my engagement in social media and my engagement with production, my engagement in the aviation community and, and business world, but I'm involved in all these secular areas of engagement. And I see a lot of the same things, a, a problem with imagination. I'm going to start with um, social media because that kind of highlights everything. It's my finger on the pulse of society. What are some of the concerns that, that I see in social media? People want to simply be heard. This is thing, one of the anxieties. Another anxiety is people want to be named. They want to name themselves, or well, they think they want to name themselves instead of being named by their community. People have this urge for the transcendent. And because Christ isn't being proclaimed to them in a way that they are able to receive it, because what's received is received in the mode of the receiver, and they have this poor imagination for who Christ is because people keep coming at them with ideologies of who Christ is instead of being present to them and helping and giving them an account for their story and their hope better than they could come up with themselves, like we see in, in the Emmaus journey, or Emmaus, if you want to say it like that. If people don't have that, they're gonna have an, a poor imagination for who Christ is. They're gonna see the church as an ideology, an institution that's parallel to all the institutions that they already don't trust. So where do they put their hope? They put their hope in technology. They put their hope in artificial intelligence as some way to download our consciousness for the future, to have eternal life in that manner. These, these aren't just, these aren't just projections of mine. These are things that people actually believe and hold to be true. They hope in the transcendental. That's a great, that's a good thing, but how do, they, how do many of them hope in it? Well, they see something beautiful and they think that's the ends instead of um, what it's actually pointing at. They engage in psychedelics and experience a, some sort of um, neurochemistry change that gives them an experience that points them to something ineffable, or so they think, and they often get caught up in that. On that topic. In 62, um, paragraph 62, furthermore, it is hoped that many laity will receive a sufficient formation in the sacred sciences. Nope, wrong part. There you go, same, same paragraph. <laughs> Let them blend the new sciences and theories and the understanding of the most recent discoveries within Christian morality and teachings of Christian doctrine so that their religious culture and morality may keep pace with scientific knowledge and with the constantly progressing technology that they will be able to interpret and evaluate all things in a truly Christian spirit. 
How do some Christians or Catholics receive this? They receive it sometimes with criticism saying, oh, so you're just trying, we're, we just need to blend the, the, the truth that we find out there or blend the technology that we have out there with, um, with what we already know to be true and we're gonna water it down. No, that's not what it's saying. It's not saying, okay, come up to this person who thinks they know something about the, the good effects of psychedelics. So it helps, helps some people overcome addiction. It helps some people um, become okay with certain anxieties that they have. Okay, let, let's just incorporate that into Christianity and we'll dilute what we know to be truly transcendent in a way. That's not what a Christian would do. A Christian would possibly enter into a dialogue with this person in a way that helps them to understand why they think what they think to be good. And this isn't just beating them over the head with an ideology. This is walking with them. It's, it takes a lot of time and effort and energy. I'm walking with several people right now in that exact same place. This, this goes across the board, not just on that topic. Um, it's an another, I guess you could say, concern within social media is the context switching that happens immediately, for, that tends for, toward immediate gratification. It changes the neurochemistry of, of people. They, they have, they reset their ability to, well not ability, they, they reset the, the levels that they are capable of, of um, tolerating, I guess you could say, between dopamine hits. And they get used to that. And then they can't sit and they can't contemplate. They can't sit with a topic more than five minutes. So instead of telling them, oh, well, you need to do this in order to sit, to sit down and receive all these, all these ideas that I'm throwing at you as a Christian, that's never gonna work. What is gonna work? Well, first, helping them get over certain addictions by walking with them. Second, giving them an account of their story and encouraging the, the truly transcendental or beautiful things that they see, which takes a lot more work than a lot of us are willing to give it. So how are we, as Christians, going to walk with people instead of just talking at them of what they learned at this gathering. How is it that we're going to, to live the truth of the gospel instead of preaching at people? That was one of the tension points in how this, doc how this document was developed and received. There's a question, are we in dialogue with the, with the world or are we proclaiming to the world? And as, as you all know is that any good theological answer is both and. Well, how do we imagine dialogue to be? Does dialogue mean Receiving something in a way that compromises the integrity that we have? No. What does proclaiming mean? Pro does proclaiming mean beat someone over the head with a, a truth that we have had that has been specially revealed to us as a community? No. This truth was given to us in a very particular way so that we could truly see and believe and live in the way that Jesus lived in the world. So where am I going with all of this? Working with Father Michael on the Lay Mission Project, I've seen a lot of people transformed. And all it takes is an introduction into their calling. So many Catholics don't know what they're called to don't know the beauty of participating in the salvific work of, of the church, the same mission of our Lord. So many of them who come into the church are taught, given an imagination, that their role is to be a passive recipient of the graces afforded in the sacraments and to sit piously and devoutly in the pews. And even if they're told to go out there and do good in the world in some ambiguous way or in some other way that gives them the imagination that what they mean is to volunteer in the church or to participate in ecclesial ministries. Well, not everyone's called to that. And what are people called to? All you need to do is give them that little, little bit of information that they are called to be agents of the church, ecclesial persons. And that starts their journey. It starts their journey of true discipleship. And in order to be a disciple, it, we're not lone wolves. 
we have to do this in community. Not only because we need the support of the community to go out and do that, but we need to do it in community because it helps us to see, it helps affirm what we see, correct what we see, gives us more things to chew on so that our imagination may judge rightly, help us judge rightly. So our task as leaders in the church is to call people to, to realize their special, their unique and irrepeatable role in the church, which is actually in the world. And that's what this document is all about. It's about going out there, not as an individual, but as a person called the vocation of the community from there, from that place, discerned in that community of disciples out in the world to be in true dialogue in all of these places that, that Shanu talked about as the, the toothing stones. The toothing stones uh, in architecture are the, are the parts of a building that are sticking out to be able to latch onto to build another part of that building. That's the image that, that he came up with which influenced this document. Where are the toothing stones in your engagement in the world? Where are those places that you could build upon the good, the truth, and the beauty that you see out in the world? Where is it that you could build on in order to have a authentic dialogue based on your remaining in our Lord and asking of things in his name so that we can live out John 17 to be in the world and not of the world? It's very easy to make the mistake of approaching the world in the way that our world asks us to be, to be approached. So... It's very easy to enter into social media dialogues in more of an ideological sort of sense. Because we have the gift of having the truth that is transcendent, that had to have been revealed, that isn't necessarily, that isn't, by nature, um, of revelation, that, that isn't available to others. So we can't expect them to know what we know. At the same time, everything that they say that is true is never going to contradict what we know to be true. So with that, we could go into a dialogue with someone with confidence, but that confidence shouldn't be an ideology. That confidence should not be um, coming from a place that isn't attentive to how they might receive it. We must give someone what they are capable of receiving. And actually, if we give someone more than they're capable of receiving in that moment, that's perhaps counterproductive. How is it that we as disciples are remaining in him? Because apart from him, we can do nothing. So you, my brothers and my sisters, how are you real disciples? I'm not saying you're not. I'm saying how is it that you're ensuring that you have a community of people to have real conversations, to discern with, to be sent out from, because this often isn't happening in our parishes. And even if it is happening at the parishes, there's a more particular community of yours that you need to be in dialogue with. Do you have true disciples as friends that you could ask these questions to and discern with? Do you have priests and brothers that you could go to in these dialogues? Do you have a routine to develop virtue? The, the virtue, not just of the piety that, that, that we are called to, but the virtue of of the habit, I guess is a better way to say it, the habit of how to approach the world. In my own engagement in the world, it's taken a lot of attention and effort in order to not go down some of those slippery slopes of entering into social media in a way that is a little too focused on the algorithm and getting attention. And I justify it sometimes by saying, oh, well, also that attention will help give me the clout and people will, get, will give me more authority in order to re receive me better. It's true to some extent, but where is it that I'm perhaps flawed there? And I've been corrected by my brothers in a way that has helped remind me to, to continue to engage the world rightly. So who is it that, is, that, you, are in, that you are friends with that help keep you accountable? that give you energy, a perpetual inspiration, if you will, to go out into the world with courage 
and the courage that doesn't lead to an ideological approach, but a relational one. Because if we are true disciples, we are engaging the world as our Lord did, and he did not come to condemn the world, but to love it so that the world might be saved. And that happens in and through you as the subtext, as the church, as members of the body of Christ. Thank you. Okay, I don't see microphones yet, so I'd be happy to start the conversation, Sister Marianne, if that's all right. Okay, maybe we can just wait for that. Um, since I was told that we can, we, we're now going to make insights. It's not just going to be questions in this uh, Q&A period. It's going to be an additional, um, if you want to say a proposition or if you want to start a conversation, be happy to raise your hand and we can start something. So I can, I have a, something that I've just been reflecting on during these conversations and over the past few days learning about this document. Um, for all of the tensions or supposed um, alleged contradictions that even exist in, the, uh, in Gaudium et Spes, there was one line that for me was my hermeneutic while prepping for this uh, convocation, reading the uh, reading this line in section 19, the first sentence, it's the root reason for human dignity lies in man's call to communion with God. From the very circumstance of his origin, man is already invited to converse with God. And so this, I, when you asked your question this morning, Father Sweeney, about what it means to be a people, um, I think this might be an answer to that because this is getting at what the root and origin of human dignity is. And human dignity is something that, um, at the most, it, it's the most foundational unifying principle of what makes us all, well, human. Um, and so, and, and, and the root of it is apparently, according to Gaudium et Ses, recognizing that we all are naturally inclined to be in communion with first truth and to recognize that that kind of relationship has already been started by God and we have to recognize it. And once we do, we've now tapped into human dignity and what that is. And so I think if we as a church are finding ways and strategies to promote that recognition, we might just be able to answer your question of what it means to be a people, at least in a, in a broader sense. We might answer it here, but in, as a church.